Welcome back to Diary of a Speed Reader. In today's episode, we'll be talking about my takeaways after reading 200 annual reports in the S&P 500. Finally finished the 200th report this week. Um, and I finished the first 100 and posted that in May and we're in such a different uh, financial market environment, but you know, the world is starting to open up and there are so many intriguing things to think about relative to what I'm reading in the annual reports and what I'm seeing and the news and economy. I'm gonna divide this segment into four parts. The first is, again, a little bit of a recap of this project and what I'm looking for when I'm reading and how I'm going about it, my takeaways. The third is gonna be uh, comments that I've really been wanting to give on women and minorities uh, within the C-suite. The last thing is answers to questions that I've been getting across my videos. But before we get into that, I just wanna remind you that in no way should you interpret anything in this video as investment advice. You should talk to your local financial professional for that. They can do an assessment of what kind of risk and return makes sense given your financial status. The second thing, if you could like, share, subscribe, or comment, I'm always thrilled uh, when anyone comments. It's always amazing that anyone uh, watches my channel, um, but I do hope that it inspires some of you who are afraid of looking at the annual report, uh, but have always been curious to just get in there. It's not a big deal. No one's gonna test you afterwards. It was a suggestion given to me on how to use my speed reading by one of my viewers. Annual report is required to be filed by the SEC uh, by every public company. And so um, I'm reading the S&P 500. I'm about 40% of the way through it. It represents 500 of the largest companies as uh, discussed through market cap within the United, that do business in the United States or listed in the United States. Some of them are actually headquartered in Bermuda. The annual report goes over their annual financials and also discusses the strategy that the company is taking and also gives you an update of what's been going on. It's basically a recap of the company's year and also an outlook for the future. And it's so fascinating because the more annual reports you read, the more you see the crossover. It's like watching a series on television where each episode introduces the background of a new character. How they all interrelate with each other is really fascinating. That's part of the reason why most of my reading has been in consumer discretionary. Um, the consumer discretionary is really an end market on the retail side. And when I look at companies that are suppliers to them in the industrial space and et cetera, it is kind of crazy crazy that they are trading in many cases at their all-time highs. Now the market, like I said, is going to do what the market's going to do. And what I said in the last episode was that a lot of these companies do have healthy balance sheets. And that will allow them not to go bankrupt, but making new highs is kind of intriguing. The reason it's intriguing is that in public equities, making new highs really indicates something very specific. You are basically buying a company's stock for their future health and ability. And if it's gonna make a new high, a new valuation, you need to think that the company is continuing to grow, continuing to expand, or alternatively, they're getting scale, so now they're gonna to continue to make bigger and bigger operating margins. They're gonna make more money off the same amount of sales. That is really not necessarily the case for a lot of the companies within consumer discretionary. And although some have operated so well, like better than you could possibly imagine given what they've been dealing with the la the, this last quarter, some may report well. I don't know that I can say they're gonna do great all the way through the end of the year. So if you're watching the markets as a story, just like any story on Netflix or miniseries on Netflix, what we really need to see is not just this quarter is gonna be fine, but some vision that the next two quarters all the way through December are gonna be great. And you've got kind of this great tension of jobless claims coming out really high, better than expected, but we've still got 14% jobless rate in the US, which in context is a little bit similar to Greece. Um, so a very intriguing situation to have consumer discretionary trading as it was before February. And so just like anyone who's intrigued after reading a book, they maybe go and learn more about the author. A lot of times after reading the annual report, I'll also listen to the earnings call. I do that for about 
uh, a quarter of the total. So I would say I've probably listened to about 50 earnings calls um, out of the 213 that I've read at this point. You know, it's really fascinating what kind of leadership that is coming into this. It's truly educational for me. Um, most companies are happy to give up some of their earnings and revenue to hire people and try to keep this economy in a great position. Two companies that I think really illustrate that kind of leadership within consumer discretionary, Tractor Supply CEO was phenomenal on the call. The end report actually is quite telling as well. It's a little bit less so, but it, you need that for context to really appreciate um, that their company truly is probably incorrectly gift in my opinion. It's in consumer discretionary, but because it basically supplies food to animals, it's a question mark whether it really should be there or should be in consumer staples, but you know, it is what it is. Um, the second company where I heard really great leadership on the call is Domino's Pizza of all places. I never would have guessed, um, but they definitely delivered <laughs> on the call. Um, you know, what I thought was unfortunate was certain analysts that came in, and maybe it's their job to do it, so I don't want to be too critical, but um, they talked about, are you gonna take advantage of cheap labor? And they were like, absolutely not. We're gonna try to hire people and help this economy. But whether or not these companies are worth investing in now, putting new fresh money to work in, it's anyone's guess. It's a little bit like watching the last season of Game of Thrones. You don't know what's gonna happen. Uh, but you know, tractor supply on the bear case is really, um, you know, the second quarter, which you'll see very clearly in the 10K, is very important from feed, livestock, um, and as well as just your planting. You've got a lot of people that are new customers coming in, uh, which they talk about on the call on the first quarter update. Um, so it's really hard. These phenomenal operator, really inspiring call to listen to. Same thing with Domino's Pizza. You know, Domino's Pizza is um, trading at like a 20 times EBITDA, something like that, over 20 times EBITDA. That's that is kind of rich, but at the same time, you've got a phenomenal operating team. It was hiring through the season. It did benefit from being mostly delivery. So who knows? And that's the beauty of uh, the markets and watching the economy is that every day is a new episode for what can come. Oh my gosh, it's so different when you hear the numbers of what the composite is versus when you're reading reports and seeing literally no female names and then looking at the pictures and seeing like very few to no minorities <laughs> as you're reading along. It's crazy. So most women um, do end up in roles like uh, accounting roles, you know, chief financial officer, chief accounting officer, um, definitely the human resources. That's where you might see a single female name, but otherwise it's predominantly white and male. That's not good or bad, I guess, in certain ways, if they're competent, especially if you're investing, but can't we do a little bit better? I'm 200 companies through and there are so few. Now, because of that, if I see a woman that's going to be on the earnings call, I will listen to that earnings call, regardless of how I feel about the stock, um, because I wanna see how gender might play a role, what I can learn from the way these women speak and answer investor questions. Now, typically, it's always gonna be the CFO and CEO definitely speaking on an earnings call. Occasionally, other players will come on the call and speak. Um, it's really fascinating to hear the same culture that's in what you just read also in the call. And in that regard, I wanna highlight two companies that if this is where you care, that you might really enjoy listening to the call. The first one is Nielsen. Now the story, if you're gonna read this, Nielsen brought in a new CEO in 2018 to basically fix and split the company in two is the strategy that they've undertaken and they are continuing to do that. The new CFO that they brought in is a woman and the new CEO that will take over the Connect Media business is a black man. I'm so excited, we need more color in the C-suite. So to listen to the three of them do that call together, I thought it was a great call of the many earnings calls that I've listened to that came early. Uh, later, as we moved into May and there was less um, movement that had to happen, the calls got better. But the first few calls that came out in that March, um, April earnings season were kind of weird in my opinion. Anyways, I would highlight Nielsen to listen to. There's a lot of great takeaways and listening to how the three of them speak um, and think about business and the, that company as it moves forward. Um, I am long the stock, I will fully disclose, but you should make your own investment decision. Now among female CEOs, I really loved listening to the earnings call as well as reading the 10K 
for uh, Hershey and for CDW, amazing professional women. They definitely are a particular style that I would say is similar in leadership as well as in presentation. But I think the standout there for me is Ventus. The CEO there was phenomenal. As a real estate investment trust, a REIT that is focused on 50%-ish senior care and then the rest on, you know, re like 10% research facilities-ish. And then, you know, the rest is hospitals and doctor's offices and stuff like that. Because they just have such a huge headcount, they use that to make sure that their facilities had masks, etc. They also partnered with um, with the Mayo Clinic to get testing early. And by the time of the April earnings report, they'd already tested most of their staff members to be able to give real statistics about who was infected, who wasn't, and what measures were being taken at each facility. I mean, and she is such a phenomenal presenter, the way she took investor questions, the way that she she allowed people on her staff to speak uh, in coordination, but also made sure that they didn't get uh, beaten up by the investors in some silly way. I just, I loved her leadership. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is a question that comes up about speed reading across the annual reports or also across literally all of my videos, and that has to do with retention memorization. And I really want to express that this is something that is poorly explained in school and in some schools, which I've subsequently discovered, just incorrect flat out. The way that we test people is to memorize a very specific line item and then write it down. We don't actually test on the more common concept of comprehension, which is after reading it, do you understand it well enough to actually apply it to your life and make it have meaning? For most people after they graduate from college, that's what they're actually trying to seek from a book. So let me give you a good example. In the last um, little bullet point, I talked about Ventus and glowed about why I loved her as a CEO and also talked about their business, which I said was about 50% senior care and the rest of the business was 10% innovation in healthcare, like labs, that sort of thing, and hospitals. Okay. There are actually very precise numbers on those pieces of business in the annual report. I have them written down in a notebook. Every company I, I read, I, I take notes on, and I take them in, over time now, a very specific format, so that when the conversation it matters for precision, I give you precision. But I'm not trying to store precision in my head because this is Diary of a Speed Reader, and also, in my particular case, I'm not analyzing specifically healthcare REITs and responsible for answering to a set of investors for that. If that were my job, 100%, I would be able to give you precisely the number to the dollar, right? Um, instead, what's more important for me when I'm reading these is to understand, do I like this company? Do I dislike this company? What approximately was going on? Did I see anything that was really weird? For example, broadly across the casinos, with the exception of one of the casino operators, most of them have their lease agreements, their casino license coming up in 2022. And Macau can actually take back the casinos starting 2020 at the end of the revenues of this year, some as early as 2017. But the point is, I didn't miss that. That's in the disclosure section. Now, I think that one of the casinos has already kind of made movements for what it would look like afterwards, but it's still the case. This is probably some of the lowest volume, so if Macau wanted to take that back, they would take it back at the lowest rate. And I didn't miss that in the reports, by the way. So, you know, the gist, the comments, the things that are unique, that the things that are remarkable, I'm gonna notice that as I'm reading, and that's probably the more important part to me given my use case. It's also the same as if you're listening to a friend talk. You're not gonna memorize what she said word for word and then spit it back at her. That's probably not gonna go that well. What you probably should be listening for, I'm hoping, <laughs> is what is it that they're trying to communicate? What is the concept going on here? Are they trying to cover up a loss? And so they're trying to tell you why you should ignore that? Like in the case of Nielsen, they do have a really big impairment and that makes it very confusing when you look at data feeds and what have you. So a lot of the report discusses that impairment and why you need to think about it differently than just some number that ended up through a data stream. You know, this is true across all of the annual reports and all of the things that the CEO is trying to talk you through. That's what I'm gonna retain, that's what I'm gonna care about, and that's what I'm gonna read the reports for. 
that's all I've got prepared for today. On a personal note, I just wanted to mention that reading these annual reports has been so enriching for me, especially being quarantined here in New York City, really on top of one of the major locations of where protests are happening. It's really great to escape into various businesses and understanding what's going on in the economy so that I can kind of separate the wheat from the chaff as I listen to the news and the such. I hope I'm helping others to feel they can read whatever they want to read because I do think that the mind rewires and it can rewire in a very positive way depending on what you choose to read. I hope everyone is staying safe. I hope everybody's family is healthy and I hope everyone is able to achieve the goals that they want to in this very, very crazy time. Till next time, take care.